Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christy Risk, Senior Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator for today. The title of today's webinar is Molecular Syndromic Testing in the ER, Assessing the Impact on Pediatric Care, and our sponsor is BioFire Diagnostics. Our panelist today is Dr. Jennifer D.N. Bard, Director of Clinical Microbiology and Virology Laboratories at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and Assistant Professor of Clinical Pathology at the University of Southern California. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the control panel, which usually appears on the right side of your screen. Click on the Q&A box on the upper right side of the control panel. When you click on Send To, please select All Panelists. We will ask the panelist questions after the presentation has concluded. Dr. Deanne Bard, please go ahead. Thanks, Christy. And I would like to thank BioFire Diagnostics for inviting me to speak today on the film array gastrointestinal panel and our findings from the multi-center study. Okay. So some quick disclosures that I have here summarized. Then the objectives for today's talk will include a discussion on the approaches to syndromic testing with emphasis, of course, on testing for acute gastroenteritis. I will also provide a brief overview of the Fermeray system and how it works. And then lastly, the majority of my talk will be focused on the multi-center study that I've had the pleasure to be involved in, looking at the effectiveness of the Fermeray GI panel to aid in the diagnosis of acute gastroenteritis and the potential impact in the lab and on patient management. So infectious diseases is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the pediatric population. For any of you who have kids or have been in contact with kids or have had a kid sneeze on you or vomit on you, which full disclosure is all of the above for me, this should come as no surprise. Children are petri dishes full of germs and highly susceptible to multiple infections. Some key characteristics to highlight about infectious diseases in children is that the signs and symptoms can be nonspecific. They can just present with irritability, lethargy, or poor feeding. And this is particularly the case in neonates and infants. Other key findings to look for would be the presence or absence of rashes, their appearance such as vesicular versus maculopapular, site of infection, and vaccination history, um, because it's unfortunately not uncommon for children to come in with no vaccination history. The top five symptoms that children present with are typically respiratory symptoms, including cough, stuffy nose, uh, followed by fever and GI symptoms. Fever is, of course, nonspecific, where you can basically present with, any, with that as well as any of the other four symptoms. Um, in fact, fever is present in more than 50% of patients presenting with gastrointestinal symptoms. The diarrheal illness is common and represents a significant burden worldwide. And this is especially so in children less than five years of age, where it's associated with high morbidity and mortality. In the pediatric population, gastroenteritis accounts for 1.5 million outpatient visits, 200,000 hospitalizations, and 300 deaths annually in the U.S. Um, this is associated with a significant medical costs at about 250 million direct costs and $1 billion indirect costs. There are a variety of causative agents of gastroenteritis with viruses accounting for the vast majority at 75 to 90 percent of all infectious cases. Um, in kids less than five years of age, rotavirus is the number one positive agent and accounts for a third of all diarrheal illness and hosp related hospitalizations. So the slide here just looks at the incidences of gastroenteritis in families, and the question of which came first really applies here, the chicken or the egg. Um, is it the parent or the child? And as you can see from the graph on the right-hand side, the incidence patterns of infection between children and parents match up pretty nicely, and both parents and child appear to have diarrhea illness at least within the same four-week period. Um, overall, there's more incidences in children than there are in the adults. The study also looks at the impact of gastroenteritis on visits to general practitioner, um, hospitalization, patient or parents' absence from work, children's absence from school or daycare, and then lastly, medication use. 
And so overall what they found was that um, there was an increase in general practitioner visits in children at 18.3% compared to parents at 8.6%. And hospitalization was solely um, in children, mainly in toddlers and infants. And there was also a significant it, amount of absence from work as well as daycare. So it's a burden for everybody when um, gastroenteritis is involved. And when you look at the medication use, about 16% of these patients are treated for the illness. Um, like whether they needed it or not is questionable. Um, in line with this finding, another study found that 7% of patients with um, diarrheal illness will take antibiotics for their illness and that 32% of them takes antibiotics even before visiting the healthcare provider. So highlighting the overuse of antibiotics and whether it truly is necessary in certain cases. When looking to diagnose acute gastroenteritis, you have to include um, a non-infectious process in the differential diagnosis as well. So these include the GI symptoms, such as irritable bowel syndrome, um, pseudomembranous enterocolitis, and appendicitis. There are other extraintestinal infectious conditions that may also result in similar GI symptoms, such as bacterial sepsis, otitis media, meningitis, and UTIs. From the infectious side on on your left-hand side, um, there are a variety of positive agents associated with infections, and these, um, these symptoms are, can be quite similar and overlapped, even regardless of the organism that is infected. Um, so viruses are the most common at about 75 to 90%, as I mentioned, being the top, or, top pathogens being rotavirus, adenovirus, and norovirus. Bacteria accounts for 10 to 20% of cases, in, and these include Salmonella, Shigella, and Campylobacter, et cetera. And then lastly, specific parasites can also be associated with gastroenteritis, such as the Cryptosporidium and the Giardias. There are a variety of traditional testing methods available to diagnose gastroenteritis. This includes the traditional stool culture that can take anywhere from two to five days, depending on the pathogen that you're looking for. The ovarian parasites is next, and this is truly a dying art as the more senior and experienced parasitologists are, have retired or will be retiring in this near future. Um, the turnaround time for this can also take anywhere from one to seven days, and is also limited what you can pick up from the OMP stain. Uh, next are your immunoassays and your direct fluorescent assays, and this can only really detect a restrictive number of bacteria, viruses, and parasites. The most common utilization of these two methods are the um, detection of rotavirus, shigatoxin producing E. coli, the cryptosporidiums, and the giardias. And finally, you have your traditional lab-developed PCR test. Um, the sensitivity and specificity for these methods vary, and it's all highly dependent on the method that you're choosing. So what are some difficulties in diagnosing acute gastroenteritis? As I mentioned in the previous slide, the symptoms of different organisms causing gastroenteritis can overlap. So therefore, it can be unclear from the clinician standpoint what the patient is infected with and what tests they should request. Most institutions continue to rely heavily on traditional culture methods, which is associated with its own issues, including complexity of sample types, interpretation, judgment, um, significant delays and, and turnaround time. It's also not really a standalone test, and a lot of the pathogens associated with gastroenteritis cannot be cultured or recovered by traditional methods. The sensitivity, as I mentioned before, is also a big issue when it comes to culture, and it's not uncommon to detect nucleic acid found from a sample that was culture negative. The next difficulty with diagnosing acute gastroenteritis is the fact that even though a test is ordered, the sample may never actually be submitted for testing. This is particularly an issue if the patient cannot provide a sample in the clinic or in the emergency department and is sent home with this complex collection kit with instructions to return the sample. And I know this is a big issue when it comes to our patient population here in LA, since we are based in a pretty urban central area and many of our patients do not have automobiles and rely on public transportation, which is not particularly the greatest in LA. And lastly, the, the, the last point is the minimal benefits or the misconsumption that there may be minimal benefits to the patients since 
typically there's maybe a higher cost because in general to pick up most of the gastroenteritis pathogens, you need about one to 10 tests that can be ordered at a time, which is of course associated with a cost issue. And then the fact that 60% of the time these, patients, these test results will come out as negative anyway, so there's minimal benefits to the patient in that way that you still do not have a diagnosis. So what the past few, in the past few years, there have been significant advances in molecular technologies, particularly with the availability of sample-to-answer instrumentations that have allowed for the shift from high-complexity molecular testing to a more moderate complexity testing that can be adopted by multiple laboratories that lack the skill set required to perform traditional nucleic acid amplification and extraction. Um, this is extremely important since there are many labs that do not have the personnel and administrative support nor the infrastructure support to perform complex molecular testing. The angle behind these types, these sample to answer type of technologies is really syndromic testing approaches, which is by no means a new concept. Traditional microbiology testing really does consist of syndromic testing. So, for example, a stool culture is performed on a patient that presents with diarrhea or other gastroenteritis symptoms, and CSF cultures are ordered on a patient presenting with infections of the central nervous system. The provider will assume that all relevant pathogens will be isolated and identified if present. So the shift from syndromic testing to individual target testing really only occurred during the initial availability of molecular tests, and this is mainly the case for viral pathogens. For example, viral cultures were replaced by specific targeted PCR, such as CMV PCR, EBV PCR, HSV PCR, et cetera. And genital cultures were replaced by the most, for the most part by GCCT NAT testing. There are many benefits to utilizing syndromic molecular panels, including the broad spectrum of targets that are generally included in a panel and is representative of the vast majority of pathogens associated with a specific infectious disease. Also, because it is a molecular test, the sensitivity is quite high, and it will include the chance of detecting more true pathogens as well as polymicrobial infections, which can play a role in the diagnosis and optimization of patient therapy. In addition, due to the simplicity of the sample-to-answer technology, they, you can streamline and simplify testing in the lab and this is really in contrast to traditional workup that is quite complicated, requiring specific skill sets that are in dire need in many labs at this point. And lastly, the turnaround time can be significantly faster when you're using a syndromic or molecular panel compared to the traditional methods. So this slide here just currently summarizes the panels that are available from, um, that are FDA cleared from different companies. As, as so it's usually, it's, so basically we started off with the respiratory infections, followed by bloodstream, GI, and then the central nervous system infection. And as you can see, BioFire has been very successful at implementing these type of panels for a variety of different syndromes, including the um, gastrointestinal panel. The GI panel from BioFire is tested on the fumarate system which is an integrated system that allows for sample preparation, application, detection, and analysis for all within one hour. And the image here is of the new TORCH system that was um, FDA cleared for um, clinical use. And basically, it allows for multiple tests, runs multiple testing of samples at a time instead of the one at a time that you're usually used to with the old system. Um, the GI panel is the most comprehensive one on the market, which simultaneously detects for a total of 22 targets, 13 bacterial, five viral, and four parasites. The sensitivity and specificity is quite high in the high 90s, at 98.5% sensitivity and 99.3% specificity. And hands-on time is minimal at about two minutes with a turnaround time of about one hour. So a quick few slides on how the system actually works. Um, so from, for the, with regards to this GI panel, a stool sample is collected in Cary Blair transport media, and prior to the run, the user will inject a hydration solution and sample combined with the sample buffer mixed into the pouch. And the vacuum in the pouch will ensure that the correct volume of hydration solution and the sample is drawn into the pouch, so you, there's really no need for accurate pipetting. 
Um, the pouch is then inserted into the system and is, is tested in an hour. So this is an overview of the pouch itself. So you can think of it as a two piece. The top one is the top, the freeze dried pellets for reagent storage. And the bottom is the chemical circuit board where the test is actually being conducted. Um, in, the, in the circuit board itself, there are three phases, the sample extraction and a nucleic acid purification, followed by first stage PCR, which includes the reverse transcriptase phase at this stage. And then also a second stage PCR with detection by a high resolution melt analysis. So in the first part of the pouch, the specimen, as I mentioned, is, it will be bead beaded to disrupt the organism, and then nucleic acid will be bound to magnetic beads, which are then washed and purified and eluded to the next stage. First stage PCR is a massively multiplex PCR with dozens of primers for all assay targets. And so following this PCR, the reaction is diluted 100 times and flooded into the array. And the array has specific primer pairs for the particular analytes spotted at known locations for the second stage PCR. Then following the second PCR, the software performed an automated analysis where all the targets are tested in triplicates on the array and two out of three replicate wells for a particular assay must be positive in order for the target to be considered a true positive. Um, a well is considered positive if the DNA melt peak falls within an analyte-specific range. And also the melt peak must be similar to each other in shape and position. So this really allows for a very high specificity and also high sensitivity as these melt peak characteristics are sequence specific. And it also allows you to detect these melt peaks even in the absence of an amplification curve. And then finally, with regards to interpretation, you get a very simple report that is generated and you either see a detected versus not detected on each target. So as I mentioned earlier, there are a total of 22 pathogens included in the gastrointestinal panel. Um, the bacterial targets include the what's listed here, Campylobacter, C. difficile, Plesiomonas, et cetera. It also identifies Vibrio and speciates to Vibrio cholera. Um, for the diuretogenic E. coli slash Shigella, there's a variety of them. There's actually four diuretic, um, diuretogenic E. coli, and then there's also Shigella slash enteroinvasive E. coli. The viruses included are the top most common ones associated with gastroenteritis, including the adenovirus, 4041, norovirus, rotavirus. And then lastly, for the parasitic target, cyclospora is also included with the um, rest of the targets. And this is important, and I'll kind of expand on this further in a few slides from now. For submission to the FDA, there was a multi-center prospective study that was conducted at four facilities. 1,555 stool samples were collected from patients with signs and symptoms of gastrointestinal infections and were enrolled and tested on the GI panel. Comparator testing included stool culture, real-time PCR, and sequencing. And the GI panel picked up a, an organism in 53.5% of all of the um, samples that were tested. And out of these positive samples, 68.5% were detected in a single organism, and then polymicrobial detection was identified in 31.5% of the cases. And the majority of these cohen detections consisted of two targets, but there were some that actually picked up six targets in one sample, up to six targets in one sample. And then slide here just summarizes the overall sensitivity and specificity for each target group that was found in the clinical trials. And they all range from the mid-90s to 100 with very high specificity overall from 97.1% to 100%. So one of, one of the great things about the film array technology is that it's conducive to the stat testing approach um, the example I have here is from Seattle Children's where they implemented a respiratory bowel testing in the core lab since microbiology lab was not available 24-7.
And so what they found was that despite the fact that their testing volume increased by almost 50%, the mean turnaround time was decreased from seven hours to 1.6 hours with the implementation of the film array respiratory panel. And in line with that is the fact that the film array respiratory panel easy or is now approved as a clear wave test by the FDA, which is kind of a game changer and will allow for further decentralization and brings testing even closer to the patient. So some potential benefits of the GI panel in your institution. Um, implementation of the panel um, to replace traditional methods can allow for rapid and comprehensive diagnosis of gastroenteritis, this addresses the issue that physicians often do not know which pathogens are detected in stool examinations. Um, this insufficient physician knowledge could have negative consequences for patient care and as well as for public health. Results from a survey found that a high proportion of physicians, up to 77% in California, believed that a routine stool culture would include testing for E. coli 0157H7, when in fact, as part of the survey, the lab method used would not detect this pathogen. Um, they were also unclear whether routine stool culture would pick up Yersinia or Vibrio, and whether Cryptosporidia or Cyclospora species would be detected by routine ONP. Um, another reason why a GI panel can be beneficial is that due to the simplicity and rapid turnaround time of the test, it may, be, it may potentially change the physician's standard practice and testing practice and prompt an increase in laboratory investigation of gastrointestinal illness. Um, a study published in 2002 found that of the individuals that visited a healthcare provider, 21% of these stool studies were requested, and only 89% of these patients actually complied and returned a sample. Um, another interesting finding was that the patient's clinical presentation and the costs were really not associated or hindered test requests from the physician's perspective. Rather, the main reason why cultures were not being requested was that the test was not likely to yield a pathogen from, pathogen from the physician's standpoint or to alter the chosen treatment. So therefore, an incre the increased sensitivity or comprehensive targeting of the uh, primary GI panel may address some of these shortcomings. Um, another benefit of the GI panel is related to infection control and prevention. The CDC recommends that contact precaution for patients with diarrhea due to sus should be implemented due, um, for patients with diarrhea due to suspected infectious um, gastroenteritis, but this can be difficult when there's an absence of lab evidence. Um, I summarized two studies here on this slide. The first on the top is a study that looked at 158 stool samples that were previously found to be negative for C. difficile and rotavirus. Um, these samples were tested on the GI panel, and an additional 35 samples were positive from the GI panel with at least one infectious agent. The majority or the top one, the top pathogen that was detected was norovirus followed by rotavirus in the study. So the detection of the additional rotavirus really raises the, the concerns for sensitivity by the traditional method. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that I would go back to the benefits of including cyclospora in the panel. Um, the second study here summarizes the identification of cyclospora outbreak that was really unintentional. The sample was part of a study and was tested on, this, on the film array GI panel and found to be positive um, a week before it was detected in the state of Nebraska using conventional methods. And the table just summarizes the number of cases that were detected by the film array that were not ordered by clinician. Um, so there were eight that were detected that not, were not ordered. And, but it also highlights how the ordering practice changed after the outbreak. So you can see that after the outbreak, the clinicians really started to order the test to, to um, specifically screen for cyclospora since it cannot be detected routinely on ONP. There are, of course, limitations to, uh, a, to the GI panel, including the fact that maybe there's just too much information. And because of that, the fact that it also is very sensitive, you may be picking up colonization versus actual infection. And lastly, the test, the cost of the test itself may be of concern, particularly with patients, with the cost to the patient themselves and reimbursement from insurance. 
Um, in line with the first two limitations and the question about clinical utility, stool samples from, from subjects with and without GI complaints were investigated using internally controlled multiplex low time PCR. So it was a lab developed method. And so the positivity rate and the relative detectable loads were analyzed for the two groups. Um, and what they found was that in the control group or in the healthy individuals, 54% of the panel was of the patients were positive for some sort of target. And in the case control patients were the ones that actually present with symptoms, 48.9% were positive. Um, so that was kind of interesting where, you know, the more comprehensive and the, high, the more sensitive the test could be, you might just be picking up these individuals that are colonized or not truly infected. Um, and although the difference in this study was statistically significant between the, some of the more common pathogens such as Campylobacter, Salmonella, um, Cryptosporidium, et cetera, what they found was that in the control samples, there were more cases of DFRAG and of STEC as well. And there were no differences in prevalence noted between some of the diarogenic E. coli such as EPEC and EHEC. So this just again reiterates the need for judicial testing when in relevant patients only. And this really applies for every single lab test that we do. Um, you know, you shouldn't be testing bacterial screening for bacterial pharyngitis in patients presenting with a cough, and you shouldn't be screening for testing on a GI panel for patients in the absence of actual GI symptoms. So now just to quickly shift gears um, before I kind of segue into the, the multicenter study, I wanted to highlight the incidence rate of gastroenteritis in children and why the, the study that we conducted was performed primarily on children. Um, the data here was from the multicenter clinical trials data that was published in 2015 in JCM. A total number of 1,180 targets were detected, and as you can see from the highlighted slide table here, um, the majority of these positive occurred in patients between the ages of 0 to 21 years of age. Um, prior to initiation of the multicenter study, the group at Primary Children's and University of Utah looked at the prevalence of GI pathogens on the film array panel in patients less than 18 years of age. Um, these patients were evaluated for diarrhea at the Primary Children's Hospital, and they found that using the, G, the film array GI panel, there was a 52% positivity rate, um, and also a number of co-detections at 15%. And the top most common pathogens identified in the series was, a, was norovirus at 11%. Further analysis of the prevalence in outpatients versus emergency department versus inpatients identified an increase in pathogen detection in patients presenting to the emergency department. So only a slight increase in bacterial pathogen from 26 to 28 percent in the ED, but there was a significant increase in positivity for viral pathogens in the ED. And then, and it also saw an increase in um, code detection at an additional 10 percent. And lastly, an overall negative rate was lower from patients in the ED at 32 percent compared to 51 and 53 percent. They also, in the study, they also identified the seasonality of pediatric diarrhea according to pathogen, where bacterial detection was much more common in the summer months through April through September, and the viral detection was much more common during the winter months, October through March. And um, what was noteworthy was, as well was that toxigenic C. difficile infection and norovirus G1, G2 had less distinct seasonality and the cases were identified in every month of the period that were tested. So for the rest of the talk now, I will summarize our findings that we found thus far. Um, so this is a multi-center study that included a number of different institutions, and we wanted to assess the impact of the femoral AGI panel in children presenting to the ED with acute gastroenteritis. So this study included pediatric patients enrolled in the emergency department at five pediatric medical centers. Uh, we conducted a step wedge quasi um, experimental study, meaning that the time of crossover from pre to post implementation was unidirectional as well as randomized for each site. 
the patients who were eligible for enrollment in both the pre-implementation and post-implementation, or in intervention, sorry, were kids less than 18 years of age presenting to the emergency department with gastroenteritis, and the duration of the symptoms had to be greater than 24 hours, but less than 14 days. And they must be able to provide stool sample within 48 hours in the post-intervention phase. In the pre-intervention phase, that was just an option. Um, other procedures include a structured questionnaire that was provided to the clinicians and other healthcare providers um, before each initiation of each um, phase of the study, and a baseline um, extension chart abstraction for each patient enrolled, extensive um, chart abstraction for each patient enrolled, followed by a follow-up questionnaire for the patient seven to ten days after the initial presentation. Um, for the pre-intervention phase, the patients were enrolled and observed, meaning that um, standard of care testing for GI pathogens were performed at the discretion of the provider. Um, stool samples were requested from the patients, but only for retrospective testing on the film array panel. So these results were not reported to the provider or in the medical charts. In the post-intervention phase, Prior to implementation, the providers were educated on test platforms and the pathogens that were included in the GI panel. They were also given an a link to an educational website that provided information about each target that was included in this panel. Once the film array GI panel was implemented for the study, the patients were, in the post-implementation, the place patient were enrolled in the ED or within two days of presentation, and the GI panel was performed free of charge in real time, with the results being reported into the patient's medical records. Then with regards to the outcome, we assessed the impact on patient management, including the treatable infections detected, um, time to diagnosis, time to therapy, appropriate antibiotic therapy, absence from ch child care or from work, um, secondary illnesses in family, as well as additional healthcare encounters. So these are the five sites that were included in the study. Uh, it was Rhode Island Hospital, Children's Mercy, um, Primary Children's Hospital, Nationwide Children's, and then Children's LA. And as you can see with the step watch enrollment, um, enrollment started um, periodically um, initially in April 2015 at two sites and then gradually at the other sites as the time went on. And then um, from there, the, the post-intervention phase was um, initiated at the first couple of sites in October 2015. And then lastly, the last final enrollment of patients um, was in September 2016. Um, the data that I will be presenting over the next few slides was just actually presented at ID Week in New Orleans last week. Um, so this table here just summarizes the patient demographics of the group in the pre-intervention and the intervention period that had the film array GI panel. Um, as you can see, there was a total of 1,157 children that were enrolled in the study, 571 in the pre-intervention group, and 581 in the post-intervention group. There were no significant differences between age, sex, insurance, international travel, and pet exposure between the groups. The only significant difference identified were the season where in the um, pre-intervention, um, and then there was also a much higher number of patients involved in the summer in the um, post-intervention phase. So higher, I'm sorry, so higher in the summer in the pre-intervention and higher in the winter and the fall in the post-intervention group. With regards to clinical findings and clinical tests, there were a significant difference in the presence of fever with more in the pre-intervention group compared to post-intervention. Um, diarrhea was much more prevalent in the post-intervention and the duration before, a duration of um, of the of symptoms were much longer in the post-intervention group where it was three days before enrollment, a total of three days before enrollment instead of two days in the pre-intervention group. Then when you look at the actual test that was ordered in the pre-intervention, um, 
there were stool culture, sugar toxin, and viral studies that were kind of summarized. And as an aside, we did not include the tests ordered in the post-intervention in this study, in this table, sorry, because one could argue that the data could be skewed to, due to the fact that we were offering the GI panel during this time, um, which may have affected the clinician's ordering practice. So um, back to the pre-intervention and the, stool, the lab tests that were ordered, there were a total of 113 standard of care tests that were ordered, and the majority of these were stool cultures. And of note, only 10 orders for viral studies were placed, despite the fact that the vast majority of pathogens associated with gastroenteritis is, um, is usually a virus. So this slide here demonstrates the pathogens detected on the GI panel in both the pre- and the post-intervention group. Um, in the pre-intervention group, although there were 571 patients enrolled in the study, only 375 stool samples were submitted for retrospective testing by the film array. And again, these results were not reported in the patient charts and they were only for study purposes. Um, in the pre-period, 386 targets were detected on the film array GI panel and 630 targets were detected in the post-period. The most common pathogens detected in both groups were the enteropathogenic E. coli, norovirus, and C. difficile. And I had some highlighted here, but there, the significant differences in the number of, of um, pathogens between the two groups were found in norovirus, C. difficile, astrovirus, rotavirus, and the Shigella. And this slide here compares the detection of organism by clinician order testing in the pre-intervention group versus by the film array GI panel testing in the post-intervention group. And so a total of 23 pathogens were detected in the pre-intervention group. And most of these, as you can see from this, in this figure, were pathogens that would have been detected by routine stool cultures, such as the Shigellas and the Campylobacters. In contrast, a 434, so 74% positive rate, um, Organisms were detected in the post-intervention group, including a significant number of viruses, um, you know, basically all of the noroviruses, all of the rotaviruses, and, plent and also um, plenty of cases of C. difficile and even some parasites, so some Cryptosporidium and Giardia were also detected. Um, further comparison of the pre and the post group was performed um, and was demonstrated, as was demonstrated in the previous slide, a statistically significant increase in pathogen detection was found in the post-intervention group compared to the standard of care testing in the pre-group. So that's in the first, call it the first um, bar to your left. Um, importantly, only 15 pathogens in the pre-group compared to 95 pathogens in the post-group were identified for which treatment were generally indicated. So these include the Shigellas, the Campylobacters, Yersinia, Cryptosporidium, Giardia, Enterotoxigenic E. coli, and the C. difficile. And lastly, in the, the final bar to your right, um, there were significantly more pathogens that were identified for which treatment with antibiotics should be avoided. Um, and this includes the uh, Shigatoxin-producing E. coli slash E. coli 0157 and the Salmonella. There were five of these cases in the pre-group compared to 32 in the post-group. So basically, the GI panel could assist in quickly identifying patients that require therapy, which is usually about a small percentage of the total number of patients. And more importantly, it can quickly identify patients that do not need therapy due to the presence of a viral or other pathogens where treatment may be contraindicated. So the next question that came up were regarding patients that were hospitalized um, upon presentation to the ED, and we wanted to know what the impact of the GI and also on antimicrobial um, management was within the subset of patients. And this study was also presented as a poster at ID Week um, in New Orleans last week. Um, of the 1,157 patients enrolled, there were only 177 patients that were hospitalized. 81 in the pre-intervention group and 96 in the post-intervention group. And not surprisingly, the patients that were hospitalized had more significant comorbidities overall compared to the patients that were discharged 
at a difference of about 12%. So in line with what we wanted to analyze in hospitalized patients, this figure, this slide here just is preliminary data that was presented um, on the pre-intervention group at ASM Microbe in Boston. Um, we looked at the potential treatable or treatment modifying results within this pre-intervention group when the GI panel was performed compared to conventional method. And so when you look at just standard of care testing, antibiotics were initiated in 25 to 50% of patients that had a treatable gastroenteritis, such as Campylobacter and Shigella. And antibiotics were also given to patients with um, sugar toxin producing E. coli, rotavirus, or in patients with negative results. And then when you look at the GI panel, the fumarate GI panel data in the very same group of patients, you see that there were actually many, many more sick missed opportunities to treat, including additional cases of Campy and Shigella, um, and also further opportunities to discontinue therapies in cases of viral infections or negative results. So the findings here really prompted us to analyze antibiotic management in patients that were um, once the enrollments proceeded in the post group. So back to the hospitalized patients. Um, we compared standard of care testing in P and post group as well as in film array testing in the post group. Um, standard of care was testing, and so be, just to backtrack how I, we didn't include this in the attest table for all patients, and so I thought we thought we'd look at it anyways in the hospitalized patients, and as you can see, standard of care testing was 24.6% in the pre-group but actually 42.7% in the post group, meaning that, you know, depending on when the patient was enrolled, the physicians were still ordering standard of care testing. So I thought it was kind of relevant to include it in the analysis. Um, so that was, so 24.6% pre, 42.7% post um, standard of care testing. And then not surprising, there was significantly more positive detected by the firm array than by standard of care testing. Standard of care testing only picked up 5.2% of positives in the pre-group, 12.5% positive in the post-standard of care group, and then 70.8% of all positive by the film array GI panel. The turnaround time of standard of care testing in the pre versus the film array in the post was also compared within this subset of patients. Um, standard of test testing consisted of culture, EIA, OMP, a um, variety of other testing for C. difficile as well. And a reduction of 32.3 hours was calculated on average, and the results were available in 14, and a mean average of 14.2 hours from collection. And this time also accounts for the fact that in the most, most of these sites, the testing was only performed during the day. So this slide here just summarizes the pathogens that were detected in each group, so pre-standard of care, post-standard of care, and then post film array GI panel. For the GI panel, there was a code detection rate of 36.8%, um, so 25 out of that 68 patients. And also note what's noteworthy is that in the post period, the most common pathogens detected by the film array GI panel was norovirus, at 27 and C. difficile at 21. Um, in contrast, based on just standard of care testing, the most common pathogens were Salmonella and C. difficile, and that's due to the fact that many of many of these um, clinicians were not ordering viral studies. So overall, 33 positive patients would have been missed in the post period if only standard of care testing was ordered. So the biggest part that we really wanted to look at also was um, antibiotic treatment and management in these hospitalized patients. So 13 patients each in the pre and in the post group were treated with antibiotics. And these were antibiotics that were relevant for the gastroenteritis presentation. And the table here represents the pre group. So despite treatment initiated in all 13 of these patients, Standard of care testing was only ordered on five of these patients. And of the five, three patients were positive, 
for a um, code detection of norovirus, adenovirus, and rotavirus, C. difficile, and then E. coli 0157. And um, when we looked at what, what sort of antibiotic change occurred after the results came back, antibiotics were discontinued once C. difficile result was back. So they were assuming that the patient was likely just colonized with C. diff. Um, but in total, the patient still received a total of four days of vancomycin therapy due to the fact that there were delays in getting the result back. In contrast, antibiotics were continued in the patient that was positive for norovirus and was initiated in the patient um, at 48 hours after the E. coli 0157 result came back. And then lastly, the rest of the patients were treated for 24 to 48 hours before discontinuation, but this was not based on any testing results since none were ordered. And of the patients, of the 13 patients treated in the post group, nine were positive. I apologize, it's, um, yeah, so sorry. So nine were positive by the film or AGI panel, and the most common pathogen detected was C. difficile. So antibiotics were appropriately discontinued in six of these patients in less than 24 hours, and two additional patients also had antibiotics discontinued, but they were based on standard of care test testing since the patients were enrolled late in standard of care, and some of the tests were back already. And then antibiotics were also appropriately initiated quite quickly, so within the same day, or continued in um, four patients um, with Salmonella shigella and C. difficile. So a quick note on code detection with C. difficile within the subset of hospitalized patients that we analyzed um, in the post group, 16 or 70 percent, 71% of all C. difficile positive patients detected by the GI panel were also positive for another pathogen. Um, these second path secondary pathogens included vir 13 viruses, two bacteria, and then one toxin producing E. coli. Um, norovirus was the most common one at nine out of the 16 co-infections. And um, the what we've actually noted that was quite interesting was that the simultaneous detection of norovirus and C. difficile um, allowed for the discontinuation of antibiotics in two patients that were greater than 10 years of age. Um, the other seven patients did not have any antibiotics initiated despite the fact that C. diff was detected. And this is likely due to the fact that norovirus is also detected. And all of these seven patients in this group were less than two years of age, so where colonization of C. difficile um, is much higher or more prevalent. Um, so only two patients total out of the overall 21 hospitalized patients that were positive for C. difficile were actually treated with metronidazole for C. difficile infection. The first patient was a one-year-old, and the second patient was a 13-year-old, and in both cases, C. difficile was the only targeted, target. Um, so the findings here kind of demonstrate the potential benefits of multiplex PCR panels that can assist in the identification of a colonization versus a true infection, um, as in the case with C. difficile. Um, so this last, this final slide with regards to study data um, includes all patients again. So the next question that we really wanted to look at was um, the impact on additional of the GI panel on additional visits after initial ED presentation. Um, so what we found was that there were no significant difference in this case at 30 and 32 percent in addition, resulting in additional visits. Um, what we did find that was statistically significant was that um, during the winter months, there was a significant decrease in the number of patients seeking additional care and visits. And in the post period, um, compared to the post period, um, so basically with the GI panel, um, there were decreased numbers of visits or return visits and addition, patients seeking additional care in the winter months. And then the opposite was actually found in the summer months you can see here in this figure. So in summary, for some of for these 
data that we have thus far from the study. Um, implementation of the film array GI panel for children presenting to the emergency department with gastroenteritis can result in a marketed increase in overall pathogen detection, as well as a significant increase in detection of pathogens that are usually treated with antibiotics. So there can be an increased number of patients that can be appropriately treated with antibiotics. Um, also, and more importantly as well, there is, was also a marketed increase in detection of pathogens, such as, such as the sugar toxin e producing E. coli, where antimicrobials can be harmful um, and where it is important to identify these sort of pathogens. And overall, the routine use of multiplex PCR did not decrease return to visits. Um, however, during the winter months, the GI panel did result in fewer patients seeking additional care and fewer visits per patient. Um, the, with regards to hospitalized patients, the film array GI panel also allowed for early discontinuation or initiation of antibiotics in eight, uh, it actually it should be nine, sorry, out of the 13 patients. And of these, um, discontinuation occurred because four were negative. One had C. difficile and norovirus, and one was a staphylovirus. And then it was initiated in two patients that had C. difficile infection, and it was with a mono, monomicrobial infection, and then one Shigella slash EIEC. And overall, the ability to detect additional pathogens alongside such, path, such targets as C. difficile prevented unnecessary treatment of patients colonized with C. diff. Some limitations of the study include um, a period imbalance with regards to the season, where pre-intervention there was more summer months, um, there were more patients enrolled in the summer months, and more viral diseases during the intervention period. Um, all, other, all patients enrolled were from the five children's hospital with pediatric ED physicians, so it really limits the general liability with regards to other um, clinicians and providers. And then all treatment may not have been captured at this point. So our next steps are to um, conduct mixed effect models to adjust for confounders that may have masked an actual association or falsely demonstrated an apparent association. Um, cost analysis, so looking at the impact of the GI panel on the overall hospital cost, and then identification of subgroups that most likely could benefit from testing. So in conclusion, the film array panel is conducive to stat testing for patients presenting to the ED with acute gastroenteritis. It allows for a definitive diagnosis in the majority of patients. Um, with acute gastroenteritis, and it allows for an increased detection of true pathogens as well as co-pathogens. It also allows for prompt modification of patient management um, where you can appropriately initiate discontin or discontinue an antibiotic. And then overall, it may prevent repeat visits to the ED or the primary medical practitioners. Thank you, Dr. Dan Bard. Thank you, Dr. Dan Bard. Uh, as a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. Uh, before we begin the Q&A, we'd like to ask attendees to give us feedback by taking our exit survey after the webinar. And joining us for the Q&A today will be Maggie Anderson, Global Product Marketing Manager at BioFire. So our first question is, uh, is the detection of C. difficile finding the toxin-producing organism or any C. difficile organism which could be a normally occurring colonization? And what is the appropriate reporting for this organism when it is in detected in children? Um, so the target is actually the toxigenic C. difficile, and I apologize if I didn't um, specify that during the talk. Um, and with regards to reporting of the target in children, uh, we have a policy in our institution, and I think many children's hospitals have the same policy, where we don't report out C. difficile, um, toxigenic C. difficile in children 12 months, less than 12 months of age, um, due to the fact that there is an increased chance and prevalence rate of colonization in that group. Uh, since the specimen is in a transport media, how do you assess specimen consistency for C. diff testing? 
You know, that's a, that's a very good question, and it can be quite difficult if it's in the transport media. Um, I guess my thing is that if it was truly a solid formed stool that shouldn't be tested for C. diff, um, you would still see it in the carry blare, but that's, that's one thing that, you know, it could be considered a limitation about the panel is that it, it does include the C. difficile testing and, and not a lot of, um, there's, you know, questions as to what the utility of having C. difficile in the panel really is. And some places would opt to actually omit the C. diff target from being reported out in general. Um, but that's one thing that's really great about the study also is that it, um, you know, allows us to have this ample amount of data to really look at all of these targets and all of the impact that it could potentially have to kind of provide a more of a, a guidance to um, the users. Does the reporting of E. coli other than EHEC have negative ramifications? For example, is there a risk of overtreatment? I don't think there's actually a negative ramification in the way that the patients would be overly over-treated. Um, if anything, it, it kind of it would stump the clinicians as to what they should, really should be doing with the result that they have in hand. And um, for the most part, I believe at least, but you know, it's again something that we kind of will look more so into for with regards to the study. But for the most part, I think if anything, uh, clinicians know not to treat or to avoid treating for some of these cases, um, and likely they're just observed as is, yeah. Is there generally a big difference in pharmaceutical treatment for co-infections? Uh, won't broad-spectrum antibiotics take care of everything? Um, in theory, it can. Um, but I guess the one thing that, you know, you also want to be cautious about the antibiotics that you would use and when you would use it. So you would want to treat um, infections that are truly required, um, you know, such as even the cryptosporidium, for example. And some of the drugs that are treated, that are required for parasites are not in line with the drugs that are required for bacteria. But also you really don't want to treat with broad spectrum to cover everything because that's really, you know, it's not really judicial use of antibiotics. and could lead to increased resistance and all of that. Um, so the best the best case scenario is really to identify the the patient that truly does require treatment, regardless if it's a co-infection or polymicrobial infection or monomicrobial infection, and to select the antibiotic that is most narrow and most appropriate for the for the pathogen. Does the panel detect both C. diff toxin and antigen so that you can be sure that treatment is necessary? The panel detects the, toxi the, the toxigenic C. difficile gene itself, so not the specific antigen. Was this GI study done using the torch or just the regular film array? The study was done using the regular, the, the older version film array instruments, um, not the torch instruments, but the chemistry and the format is exactly the same. It's basically just the outer box that's different. Is an individualized quality control plan needed for the BioFire film array panel? Yes. And so it's basically if you do not want to perform QC, um, positive and negative QC on a daily basis of, or with every run, you do have to do some sort of IQCP um, plan. And this, you know, for us, when we implement any sort of these type of sample dance or type of technologies, we generally would do kind of a 20-day, you know, positive, negative QC, just to build enough data so that we can then proceed with our IQCP um, summary and write-up. And then from then on, we would, based on the results that you get from your assessment, you can go to, um, you know, monthly QC or just new lot, new shipment, depending on what you, what's appropriate. Did you discontinue standalone testing like rotavirus, crypto, Giarda, antigen, ONP, and so on in favor of panel testing with the BioFire system? So for this study, just because it was specific to just the emergency department, um, we did not discontinue standalone testing for the other targets that we would offer to the rest of the patient population in our hospital or even the outpatient. But my understanding is that for institutions that do have it implemented, that is kind of the idea is to, um, you know, and, and also it depends on, you know, what the interests of the physicians are. 
Um, but the understanding is to kind of streamline all of the testing so that you can routinely just perform the GI panel instead of all of these various methods. And the great thing about the OMP is that, you know, for institutions that are losing their, par their experienced parasitologists, these GI panels are a great option because it includes detection of the most common pathogen parasites that you would see, such as Giardia, Cryptosporidium, and Enteromibia histolytica. And quite honestly, that cyclospore is a great bonus. Um, so in, in theory, you can um, discontinue your routine OMP and only reflex to OMP um, in cases where you're suspicious of an actual helmet egg or something and you actually have to look at the, um, the sample under the slide. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, we'd like to thank Jennifer Dean Bard and Maggie Anderson and our sponsor, Biofire Diagnostics. If we didn't have time to get to your question, we will try to follow up with the panelists. As a reminder, please look out for the pop-up survey after you log out to provide your feedback. If you missed any part of this webinar or wish to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for this genome webinar.